Are we still muted? No. They're asking about it here. Hello. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Welcome, welcome. We are going to get started in just a second. Unfortunately, we've lost the ability to have uh, the little video feed of us uh, on top of our slides. I don't understand why. Um, we can certainly try. Um, but note that we dressed up today. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're dressing up the uh, big time. Let's see if this works. Maybe? Does that oh, work? Yeah, second, yeah go and check. In our overflow room. Um, and then we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We'll get you to think a little bit about the, the uh, Arctic hare story that we told you the last time. We'll review it and then we'll have a bit of a mentee question for you. So grab a drink, everyone. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You made me a coffee. I sure did. Amazing. Um, here, hold on just one second. Somebody's saying they still can't hear. Why are we wearing jackets when our lectures are fire? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, if you'd like to talk with us, um, please sign in to um, the online chat that we have going on CourseLink. Um, and we are recording this such that if you do want to see our faces while we do it, um, <laughs> maybe you don't, um, uh, you can because we'll put it on the YouTube channel. Right up there on the uh, on the YouTube. On the YouTube. On the inter web we just have to dial in <laughs> oh, bing, bing, maybe bing. they don't know what sound that is no i don't know yeah. well that that could be a quiz question that could be a quiz question we are coming up with the best final exam dial questions. up modem you are correct oh amazing ding 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 well done <laughs> okay um, and they know it because it's used in memes. Oh, it is. It's used in memes. Yeah, it send them to us. We'll have we'll have that as a final exam question. <laughs> um, so so seriously, we've we've had some questions about the final exam. Um, so it's a fine balance, right? Because we don't want to disrespect your coming to class online and your uh, studying. We we do want you if you choose to study, um, to actually study um, and sort of express your learning. We, we know that there are a few of you that, that still want to do this. And we know that the vast majority of you, um, and, and honestly, us too, are just like checked out of like actual learning stuff, right? And that's not really the point of what we're doing. Or we're dialed in to learning a whole bunch of fucking different new stuff skills. at the same time. <laughs> We've learned a ton like of new skills. Coping skills, oh. shopping skills, distance skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tech Technical skills. Mm -hmm. We're not good at that. Although I don't know if you've noticed, but because of everything that we're going through, the university is suddenly buying a whole bunch of expensive licenses. So yeah. yay. <laughs> and we may actually send you to another platform later, but we'll yeah. we'll let you know about it's that. called something called Warcraft? Minecraft? <laughs> yeah, something? I need to learn how to play that yeah. stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so um, so the idea here uh, is is to provide you with um, an hour of, of some biology entertainment, some cool stories, some I cool things, yeah, and to get you through the rest of the course uh, in a way that that works for you. So 
Um, for the IDP, what we will tell you is, um, in our experience, one of the best ways of doing well on it is to go through 1070 vocabulary. So some of the terms, right, like gene flow or selection or um, carrying capacity and all of those like those sort of buzzwords. Um, and then take the, the subject which is personalized medicine, and see how those things might connect through the readings that that you've been that you've been suggested. Now you can read anything you want, uh, and I don't think it has to be related specifically to the readings that we give you. Um, but hopefully that'll help get you started um, to make connections with things. Um, okay, is that all you want to say about? Uh, IDP? Yep, there's some questions about the format of the final, so I'm just answering oh, that, saying it'll be fun. like your, we're, we're still writing it, yeah. um, but it's uh, it's going to be like the quizzes that you've been doing there. They'll, it'll be opened up, and we're going to, what we're pushing for is like a long period, what, that once you start it, you've got, I don't know, like year? No. Uh, days. Maybe days to write it. <laughs> days to write it. In case you've got like a two-year-old walking around going like, you know, kind of pay attention to me and you're like, I can't do this now, close it. So so our goal is to make it super flex, just as I hope is flexible, if not more than the quizzes that we've been doing. We're still waiting for the rules from the administration. Um, we need to know what the rules are before we can figure out how to get around them. One must know the rules before one breaks them. Yes. And if there is a two-year-old walking around your house and it's not yours, <laughs> Send it home. <laughs> Send it home. <laughs> totally. Ooh, we have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and it has been intense. Intense. Where'd we put them? I don't know. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah. So as super flexible as possible, you will all do well. Our goal is that you'll get, you know, at least an eighty or above on this thing, um, and uh, yeah. And, and walk away from 1070 with some pretty positive feelings. That's. Yeah. And so we're, the question is, are we calling the exam open book? Sure. Okay. <laughs> oh, totally. Open whatever book you want. Yeah. 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 Um, Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. Oh, read that book. That's a good one. If you're in a good space. Yeah. Um, and. <laughs> Caramel will come in later. Yes. <laughs> And any professor who is designing an exam using respondus or anything like that, you know, is cruel and unusual punishment as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Um, and so we've been actively lobbying the university. We've been lobbying the Twitter community to get people to just back off with this stuff. Um, and hopefully it might, it might work for some of your, your professors. Um, physics 1080, apparently. Physics 1080, we will target them and we will try to get them to realize how cruel and unusual this is. Okay. Yeah. Respond to sucks. Yeah, no, no, it's like, it's not, it's not happening in our course, but hopefully we'll be able to influence others to not do it Question, as well. Questions here about how to get them to uh, other courses to not do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, we don't, we can't do that, but. Oh, we, be... we, yeah, we, we will tweet at them. Yeah. <laughs> there will be shaming. I did put out a tweet um, last night. Um, talking about exactly that, respondus. Um, I didn't call it respondus. I think I called it a digital proctor, whatever, calling it cruel and unusual. Um, and it's getting a little bit of traction, but I'll start tagging some specific people and hopefully the message will get out that way. We'll call it intrudus. Intrudus. Yes. Cruelus. Okay. Good. Chem 1040. Yeah, respondus sounds like a spell. Let us know. We will... <laughs> We will do our best um, to, to see if we can get this thing dropped. Um, but it's still, as far as the university goes with respect to the planning, exams are considered a long way away. Yeah. Um, everybody's like in scramble emergency mode. And so, you know, the, the future has become a lot shorter uh, in time from now. Um, so just give it some time. I know it's weird. Okay, but anyway, let's tell you some stories about Wait, biology. You oh. just arrived in the future. <laughs> the respondus sounds like the name of a demon. <laughs> yeah. Or somebody else's idea was a spell. Nice. 
Oh, Expel Respondus. Expellus Respondus. <laughs> okay. Legardium Leviosa. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. We have uh, nothing to say about goldfish. We have nothing to say about goldfish, so let's move on. Yeah. Goldfish. Goldfish. Uh, don't release them. Don't release them. Okay, so <laughs> uh, we left off by talking about Arctic hair. Previously on 1070. Yes, and Arctic hair are cool because they, they, they once liter well, literally, figuratively scared the crap out of me when I was in the Arctic. Um, so, um, well, I don't know. Literally? Figuratively, because I think I had already pooped that a day. A figurative number two. Yeah, a figurative number two was dropped one time. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm pointing to a spot that's just above the blue line on one of those islands. Um, there's a migratory bird sanctuary that's there called Prince Leopold Island. This place is amazing. If you Google it, what's your Twitter handle? It will be. Um, It'll impress you. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Shoshana Jacobs. It's not doctor? No. Um, okay. So I was on this island and I was in um, a white tent, like a translucent tent, so no windows. Um, and it was the kitchen tent. It's called a weather haven. And I was sitting there. It was late at night, but of course it was 24 hours daylight. And I was sitting there having a scotch with a friend of mine. There were just about four of us in camp. The other two were sleeping and we were sitting there late one night um, just talking. And all of a sudden we heard like rattling, you know, kind of like footsteps, kind of ruffling around in our camp. And of course, the first thing that you're gonna think about is a polar bear, right? So we got really scared and we started looking at each other and with no windows in the tent, it freaked us out. And my friend, his name is Roger Bull, he's a biologist now, um, was so brave. <laughs> he zipped up the tent flap and poked his head outside. And we saw for a second this white flash. And again, because you know, you're know you thinking about polar bears, we thought this was a polar bear, but it was really small. Like after a few seconds, we realized it was really small. It was just a couple of feet away. Uh, and it was an Arctic hare that was coming by to check us out. Um, in the middle of the summer, totally white. One thing though, about that some of you, when you go to Chars or to the Arctic Ecology Field Course in Churchill in the future, as I'm sure some of you will, that you'll realize that in the Arctic, because you can see so far, the canopy is literally not above the rubber at the bottom of your shoes, uh, white in the distance, it's, it's hard to appreciate the distance. And so as, as you're being alert about bears, as you ought to be all the time, any amount of moving white, it's sometimes really hard to see how far away that is. Yep. And so figurative number two. Figurative number two. Well, if you want to see a really good example of that, um, a couple of years ago, uh, the Discovery Channel Mighty Ships did an episode um, of a trip that I led up uh, to the Arctic. Um, and there's a point in the actual documentary uh, in the episode where we get a report of a bear from uh, one of the people that um, that we were traveling with noticed this white spot. And <laughs> it turns out after the commercial break where they like ramp, ramp up the, the tension, uh, it turns out that it was an Arctic hare. So it's hard to tell how far away things are. Anyway, they're totally white. So one of the questions that we left off um, with you was why? why? Why do they not change color? Even though the background that they're hopping along in the summer in the high Arctic isn't white, the snow does melt. And we ended up kind of thinking about the, the sort of energy trade-off associated with that. Um, you know, down in the Southern Arctic, down South, um, they do change color. Um, but that's because the summer is actually a lot longer there. And the background, the brown background um, is, is around for a lot longer. And so if you're gonna invest energy in changing the color of your fur, it better be worth it, right? Energetically. Uh, and for the ones that are further south, it is worth it because the, the actual sort of summer landscape sticks around for a lot more. But in the high Arctic, it only lasts a matter of weeks before the snow comes back. Um, and it's better to be, you know, a white fur all over again. Uh, and so the idea is that that short duration doesn't 
um, make it worth it to change that, you know, during that time, the Arctic hares are susceptible to predators for sure. Um, but it's only a short period of time that bal out is outweighed by the cost associated with changing the color of your fur. That's the theory, right? So let's think about that a little bit, because if the Arctic climate is going to be warming over time, the cost benefit is going to start to change, right? And we can think about it in terms of the immediate consequences, and we can think about it in terms of the long term consequences, right? So let's think a little bit about the immediate consequences associated with this particular difference between uh, the white hair that doesn't change color and the hair that does change color and how that will be affected by climate change. So that's our first uh, mentee question for you. Um, here's the question. And uh, the mentee code is 74 five zero Super good. Thank you for joining us on Menti. That's great. Should we just say that this is going to be a final exam question? Like one of the hard ones? Something like it. Okay. This is going to be one of the hard final exam questions. <laughs> We're going to give you the answer in a second. <laughs> have to remember though to use it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the challenge is remembering to do all the things. <laughs> we can go and take a look. Okay. Great. So thank you so much. Most of you got it, although um, most of the answers total were split between A and C. So the answer is A um, because, um, and, and kind of for two different reasons. So sort of. The idea for the northern population is because the landscape color, the summer landscape is going to last longer, they're going to be white furred for much longer, which means that they will be visible to predators and therefore experience greater, uh, greater predation. In the summer population, because the change of fur is associated with photo period, they are still going to be white furred during times that are becoming increasingly warm. So the summer landscape in the southern populations will also be extended, but they won't have changed their cycle of changing their fur because it's, um, it's associated with photo period. So both of the populations are going to be experiencing greater predation, kind of for two separate reasons, um, which I think is kind of neat. So the answer is A. Um, the answer is A, I'll say it again. <laughs> um, um, and uh, um, yeah, so that, um, uh, yeah, keep that in mind for the final exam. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're going to move on with a couple of kind of important categories and distinctions. Um, first, um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between freeze avoidance and freeze tolerance. Um, and we may only get through that, right? Um, 
because of our chatter at the beginning. But that's okay. Uh, yeah? We can. Yes, yeah. and. Yes, and. And Dr. Smith is going to tell us some more chattery stories about frogs. So I think that we'll prioritize that. Yeah. yeah. So okay. you, you start. So I'm, um, you're. You're busy. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really quite busy. <laughs> You're busy on the chat. Thanks, guys, for chatting. That's amazing. Okay. So um, when we talk about dealing with cold temperatures, um, organisms can be divided up into two ways of responding. Um, either the organism tries to avoid freezing or it tries to tolerate freezing. And the way that you can avoid and the way that you can tolerate are a little bit they're subtle, they're nuanced, right? Because you can avoid freezing by bringing your body temperature to below freezing temperatures, but not freezing. So you could actually be into freezing temperatures, but not freeze, and that's freeze avoidance. Freeze tolerance means that you freeze solid and you can tolerate it, you can like thaw and, and, and come back to life essentially. So when we talk about whether something's freeze avoiding or freeze tolerating, the way that you answer that question is, is the tissue actually frozen? And if the tissue is frozen, then you know that they're freeze tolerating. But if it's not, it doesn't matter what temperature it is, doesn't matter what condition it is other than is it frozen? And if it's not, then you're freeze avoiding, okay? A little thing to kind of wrap your head around. So um, freeze avoidance is kind of our thing, right? Humans like to avoid freezing. We do all sorts of things to do it. And so do a lot of organisms, right? Um, and you can kind of avoid freezing at multiple or at different levels of organization, timescales, all of those things, right? It just depends. A lot of organisms migrate you know, they, they just get out of there uh, in order to avoid freezing and to avoid a bunch of other things, right? <laughs> avoid starving to death because there's no food, avoid whatever. But migration is a behavioral adaptation to freeze avoidance. Um, but you can also do it by, by allowing your body temperature to get really low but not freeze, like the antifreeze proteins that we talked about in the winter flounder. Um, and you can hibernate, so just kind of hang out and sleep through it. Uh, you can dehydrate uh, certain areas to avoid them from freezing. Um, so lots of different ways of sort of achieving the condition of not freezing. Similarly, although maybe restricted a little bit in the ways, just because we are dealing with biological <laughs> tissue, and so there are all sorts of rules that, you know, that must be uh, must be followed when you're when you're freezing uh, is to tolerate it. So to figure out a way to get through a cold period by allowing your tissues to actually freeze. And here's an example. Actually, you know what? I'm going to set this up a little bit because this is an example of freeze avoidance called supercooling. And if we go back here, you can see that it's on the slide um, near the bottom of the list of examples. Supercooling basically plays with sort of the physics associated with pressure um, and temperature um, and purity of the actual liquid. Um, but under certain conditions, you can take water, fresh water, to below freezing temperature without having it freeze as long as you don't have an ice nucleating agent, something that causes like a chain reaction of ice crystals to form. And so here's kind of a fun demonstration of the principle of supercooling. So we have a bottle of water that has been supercooled, and now we're going to encourage it to freeze. So just take a look at that, if you can see it. I hope you can. Okay. Let's see what this looks like. There goes. It's a good one. Woo! <laughs> Are there people in the audience? Yeah. Wow. Hey, it's working. It's working.
it is awesome young person. <laughs> okay, pretty cool, right? So you can, and you can do this at home. Um, since, super cooling it. Since perhaps you're at home. Yeah. With some time in a freezer. Yeah, if you've got time, you may be busy. Um, okay. Wood frogs, and that's where I'm going to stop talking, and I'll get on the chat. Yep, here I come. Okay. Here I come. <laughs> I'm finishing Good. my oh, sentence, and the sentence finishes like this. I will skip the ground squirrel stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell them cool stories about your frogs. Oh, yeah. About your frogs, not rugs. These, these closed captionings are kind of funny. <laughs> yes, my, my rug named Franz. My Austrian rug named Franz. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk, we talked last time about flounders um, aquatically and uh, some other adaptations that uh, Arctic hair were using terrestrially in the last lecture. And so one of the examples that we're going to use today is looking at an animal that's real, literally closer to home. This is a frogsicle. Um, I'm going to say it again so I can see what close captioning does. A frogsicle. Uh, it's closer, too different. It's neither a frog circle nor a frog sickle. <coughs> this is a frozen frog, a wood frog, that when I was a young person we called Rana sylvatica. Its scientific name is now Lithobates sylvaticus, as you can see on the slide there. And there are, if you're sitting in Ontario, um, largely if you're sitting kind of anywhere in, I'm just, nearly anywhere within Canada, there are wood frogs probably within five to 10 kilometers of you. And probably they look like this right now. They are frozen solid. There are maybe, um, they might be in the leaf litter in the forest um, near some permanent or some temporary water. Uh, and they're gonna be underground and their strategy is not to freeze a void generally. It's to freeze completely solid as you can see here. Uh, if you're if you live or wherever you are is kind of near um, near these temporary or permanent water sources, if you've heard what sounds like a lot of uh, ducks and a huge chorus of that in the spring, often when there's still snow and ice on the ground, that's a wood frog. So depending on where within North America uh, you you're looking and interested in looking at these wood frogs. Um, they may spend up to 65 to 75 percent of the year in this frogsicle state so not uh like playing banjos like kermit does uh, why am i frozen for three quarters of the year <laughs> because i'm a wood frog it's not easy being green it's clearly <laughs> That's or all alone. Came up with. <laughs> so, we miss you so <laughs> 75% of the year they might be frozen and up to 65, as the slide says, percent of their total body uh, water is frozen, critically importantly, as extracellular, so outside of the cell ice. When they're frozen, they have no physiological vital signs. So there's no, there's no heartbeat. There's no, it's not just that they're slowed down. It's like <coughs> clank, clank. This is a frozen animal. When they're thawed, they return to normal life. That takes about um, a couple of hours. And the big question is for 35 years, there's been people uh, across North America, there's a couple of big uh, freezing vertebrate researchers at Carleton uh, in Ottawa at Western uh, uh, University of, of Western Ontario down the road from us and the University of Miami, which as many disappointed people find out is in Ohio uh, when they arrive and think that they're supposed to be looking for Florida. And so for 35 years, we've been trying to figure out how they do it. And we're still learning things, but kind of a short uh, version of the story is that the frog spends a lot of time uh, feeding and trying to create uh, glycogen reserves in its liver that it can then transform into organic osmolites like glucose, glycerol, and urea. And they use this to protect the intercellular environment and that then can draw water out of cells so that uh, the water, the ice that does form, is formed extracellularly. And the point there being is that sharp or, or sort of frozen water, uh, many of you call ice, it's sharp and pointy. 
and it breaks through cell walls, which is a problem when you thaw because you're just a little mushy at that point. So here's a look um, of a wood frog in Churchill and then another life stage of that wood frog on the right hand side of the slide, which is the egg mass of the wood frog. So there's probably say 600 to 1000 little developing wood frog embryos there. They're just about to break out of little tiny bits of mucilaginous protein, this goo that they're, they're laid in and to become little swimming tadpoles. And so this strategy is really important if you're going to be a, an ectotherm, a vertebrate in the north, you're going to freeze solid, you're going to use principally glucose, but also urea as a cryoprotectant, and your organs are going to dehydrate. And we've got a video here to show you this, um, the length that you can, the, the video is about four or five minutes long. I'm going to go through so you can actually see, come with me into the forest. <laughs> And I'm going to accelerate this to, nope, you don't get to see that yet. And let's go to about there. Okay. Here we go. So here's an accelerated view as this frog in the leaf litter warms up. So it's gone from frogsicle, you can see the return of breathing, of respiration in the side of the heart there, in the side of the body, and then some spasmodic movement, the eyes clean up, and then she or he can move away. So I, the one of the digressive stories, or one of the stories that I um, want to introduce into our discussions about frogsicles is based on an experience that I had doing during my master's when I had I had gorgeous hair. And I wasn't shiny at all. And I worked with amphibians and physiological ecology. Can I, can I just say that I have never seen Alex? No, it's been it's been a lot like with hair. <laughs> I think you can tell by the date on the paper here uh, that it was received in June two thousand. So this is like so learning outcomes. Smith is old. Smith once had hair. And it's been a long time. When Smith had hair, he worked with amphibians and he worked with the physiological amphibians and physiological ecology of amphibians. And I needed to do that kind of work. I needed a lot of amphibian tissue and I didn't want to sacrifice to pith and to, to kill a lot of amphibians to get this tissue. So I used my natural history knowledge of amphibians, which is there's a lot of amphibians in this part of the world that undergo spring migrations. When those spring migrations from a, from a overwintering site to a, to a feeding or a breeding site, and when those migrations intersect with a road, there's often a lot of roadkill. So I went to an area that I knew a pond was bisected by road, and I just hung out with my flashlight collecting wood frogs and salamanders and spring peepers and toads and, and green frogs and bullfrogs that were emerging from their overwintering. And all those actually have different differing overwintering strategies. Some are avoiders, some are tolerators. Uh, and I would collect them after they got hit. So, so uh, transportation was killing them. And then I was going to then use the tissues for the assays that I wanted to look at for this enzyme called photolyase, which is a different story. So I go out with my hair and I <laughs> collect the frogs and I put literally put them in a bucket. I have a bucket of wood frog and a bucket of dead bucket of dead wood frog bucket of dead salamander, bucket of dead spring peeper, and I take them back to the university where I was working and I put them back in the freezer because uh, I that takes all night and then it's going to be a little while before I can process the tissues and do the assays that I want to see. That was, the freezer was minus 20, so that's much colder than much of the ground should get here in this, this is in Ontario that the story is taking place. So with even a little bit of snow cover, the ground is, that the, the animal's not going to get frozen to minus 20. Um, so it's very cold. The freezer is very cold. So the frogs were found dead on the road, collected for the tissue, returned to the lab, placed in the freezer. Two weeks later, I pull out my bucket of dead wood frog and I spread it out on the lab bench so I can dissect out the particular muscle or the particular organ or the skin that I want to conduct this assay upon. I'm working there with this increasingly smelly lab for about 20 minutes and a friend, a colleague comes in and he says, what are you doing? This looks pretty macabre. So I describe to him what I'm doing and he, and he points and he says, why is that one moving? So I punch him in the shoulder and I say, that's a funny joke, Dave. He's like, no, really, why is that one moving? 
So one of the frogs that was sitting on the lab bench that had been hit by a car after overwintering all winter and then being placed into a minus 20 freezer came back to life on the lab bench. Um, we were a little bit surprised by this. Frogs <laughs> who've been hit by cars generally don't come back to life. Um, and frogs that are thought frozen and then thawed and then refrozen, that's metabolically, that's an enormous stress. And that's the, so the story is kind of fun to me because it links into us thinking about physiological responses to climate change in the same way that we talked about how the hair, yes. Did you write yes. that up? No. Uh, you should write that up. Well, here it is on YouTube. No, it's... I know, but it's a really good story. <laughs> yeah, it's a good story. Oh yeah. It's a good story. <laughs> that's a good story. Yeah, it's a good yeah, story. Yeah. Oh yeah. The valley comes out when you start talking the good stories. So the um <laughs> do what wow. <laughs> so thinking about this in the context of climate change, in the same way that we did with the Arctic hair. So there's adaptations for uh molting and assuming a cryptic color, a winter color. This is now a disadvantage in places that don't have snow cover, uh, in because you're white and then exposed to predation at a time uh, when historically the ground would have been white and now you're just a white coat on a black or a or a tundra lichen colored background. In the same way, these frogs are dis are um, adapted through evolutionary time to being frozen, staying frozen, thawing, and continuing their breeding cycle. What's happening now, because there's less and less snow on the ground for increasingly unpredictable periods of times, is that these animals spend their entire active post-breeding season, but active season, feeding and feeding, getting a big giant full liver of glycogen that they can then convert into glucose and urea and these cryoprotectants, and they freeze, but then the temperatures are rising up because there's no snow to insulate, and then they drop down again, and then they rise up, and then they drop down again. We have the most important question of that story coming yes. through the, the feed, and the question is, what did you do with that frog? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, so, it's a great question. It's a great question. So we're talking about metabolic adaptations for <laughs> refreezing. And so the two answers at the end, I figured in the particulars of this frog, this is a male frog. Um, and I figured that potentially he was pre-adapted for climate change and pre-adapted for traffic because he <laughs> seemed to have survived being struck by an automobile or a truck and also being frozen, thawed, and refrozen at quite a, a, a drastically low temperature. So I made sure that he recovered. He spent the day in the lab. I massaged his little tiny amphibian shoulders. And then I took him out to a pond where I knew there were a lot of breeding females. So perhaps somewhere in the Peterborough area, there will be soon a giant super race of wood frogs. That Some is- Tough uh, motherfuckers. <laughs> yes. Yay. So. So that's the frog story. Yay. Um, now thinking about the story, one of the stories we told, talked about last time where the body fluids freeze uh, at a slightly warmer temperature than what the, the seawater is freezing at in the flounder and the woods frogs experiencing temperatures that are below freezing and sometimes drastically below freezing, minus 20. Their tissues are responding. So these are two very different strategies. Um, and they're not in, in that continuum of avoidance to tolerance I think you can see in just breaking up these or talking through these examples and the other examples that are in the uh, online unit that it's not just a categorical, it does this or it does that. There's a lot of, it depends here as well in the physiology that it, de it depends on the time of year. It depends on the species for some of these animals, like with the wood frog that has literally, I've not, uh, it has, well, it's found from Southern Ohio to um, nearly the Arctic Circle. And so, so there's even a variety of a, a range of expressions of freezing tolerance in wood frogs. I have to change that. <laughs> so. Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> Let, let's, let's not go any further. Okay. We had, we had, well, we had a story about, um, how far ahead is that story? It, well, it's, it's like coming up, I, you know, we could do another few minutes about what, what do we at least talk about it? Because I think it's good. So in vertebrate examples, we've talked about, okay, this is another big one, right? Okay. Train. Yeah.
Trade. Oh, skip. Do you want to do that? No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. I want to do this because it's kind of a Jacob's thing to do. So if we've got freeze tolerant um, ectotherms, right? So the frogs are um, ectotherms. Do we have any freeze tolerant endotherms? And by looking at this question, it basically allows us to learn more about physiology and what the limitations and the constraints are based on the different sort of life strategies, right? Whether you make your own heat or you get your heat from, from the environment, that kind of deal. Um, and what's cool is that some science associated with this question has changed a little bit in that there are some sort of freakish exceptions to a general rule. So the general rule is no, there are no freeze tolerant endotherms. Um, being an endotherm has all sorts of physiological challenges associated with it. And you do need generally to maintain your tissues above zero. Now, as we do, you know, more and more research into sort of particular, you know, exceptions, we realize that there are some endotherms that get pretty darn close to zero degrees Celsius, at least for um, a little bit of time. But the vast majority, like all of them, except for maybe this one or two that we will discover in the future, um, cannot tolerate freezing and therefore all of their behavior is freeze avoidance. Um, so the other question that we can say is, okay, fine. So none of them are freezing, but are there some that kind of manage their temperature depending upon what's going on outside? And the answer is absolutely yes. So when we talk about things like hibernation, um, we can talk about something called torpor, um, which we'll go into now just to kind of show you a little bit about the difference between those things. So um, we can take a look uh, at hibernation versus torpor uh, in endotherms. And basically torpor is hibernation, but over a really short period of time. And the physiology associated with that difference in time scale uh, is somewhat different, right? Because if you're hibernating for a long period of time, your body is becoming depleted in oxygen and a bunch of other things that wouldn't happen over a short period of time. So all of the physiology associated with distinguishing those two has more to do with time um, than anything else, because otherwise it's pretty much the same. Um, and so here's the difference, some, some kind of major differences, right? All with respect to time. Um, and the big difference physiologically is that torpor is so, such a short period of time, usually overnight, that you're not going to deplete your body of oxygen. So you can just kind of come out of it and ramp up your metabolism uh, in a way that something that hibernates wouldn't be able to. The first thing that something does when it's coming out of hibernation is it pants <laughs> like that, right? To try to get more oxygen into its body so that it can ramp up its metabolism to be able to start generating heat. Um, that's kind of the big, big difference because of the two different time scales. It's a joke. A joke? Freeze tolerant endotherm. Yeah, my significant other's shoulder when I make them mad. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, so um, the most important part of metabolism, the most important cells associated with controlling internal body temperature when you're coming in and out of hibernation or torpor is something called brown fat. Um, it's different than white fat. Most of us, are, most of our fat is white fat that looks like those big fat cells that are on the left hand side of the screen. Um, where really it's just one big sort of pouch that stores the fat inside. Um, but brown fat is a little bit different. Uh, brown fat is a series of different sort of droplets within inside the cell, and the cell is particularly dense in mitochondria. Um, and we all know from our Ontario curriculum that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Um, the cell. Yeah, so <laughs> if you remember one thing, for some reason, that's what sticks. Um, but the reason why we call it brown fat is because of the high density of uh, mitochondria, it makes those cells look very dark or it makes them look brown. 
Um, but the idea is that there's lots of mitochondria that are in contact with a lot of small high surface area fat droplets, which means that the energy um, can go straight into the mitochondria and, and start to be burned and used as long as there's some oxygen around to help facilitate that process. So ground squirrels, amazing creatures. There's a whole bunch of different types of ground squirrels. Um, and here's an example of uh, the Richardson's ground squirrel, absolutely adorable. Not a groundhog, very important to know that difference. <laughs> Actually, that'll be exam question number two. Um, which of these is a groundhog? Which of these is a ground squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ground squirrels hibernate, um, and you can see on the diorama on the from diorama the from the museum on the top left hand side uh, that there's one kind of buried down in the ground, and that they make these little sort of um, these little rooms um, in a series of tunnels, and they stay there over the winter, um, and they start out fat and they get skinnier as they're hibernating. Is pretty much the whole point of this figure. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> the cool thing though, is if you take a look at this graph, look at the one uh, for the adult male. Um, that's the second one, the middle one on the left-hand side. Basically it, it's looking at the temperature profile of uh, the ground squirrel um, as it goes through hibernation. And what you can see is that generally, just by looking at the bottom part of the data, generally the temperature of their body goes down and it goes down super, super close to zero degrees Celsius by the time it's December, January, right? It's kind of an amazing graph. It's amazing. Like, yeah. But also I hope you notice that it's pretty spiky too which means that every couple of weeks, their body temperature rises back to normal, back to 35 degrees Celsius, and then falls down really, really quickly. And then two weeks later that happens, and then two weeks later it happens again. And it's not because they're coming out of hibernation and running around and eating or something like that. It's a very short period that their body temperature spikes and then falls. Um, we'll skip this one. It's actually because they think, and still no one truly knows, um, but they think that what's happening is physiologically, the temperature of their bodies is rising. They're still in sort of a deep sleep, um, but basically they come out of hibernation into a kind of period of torpor, but then their body temperature spikes and then falls down again um, in order to allow for their body to basically detox, that hibernation and slow metabolism um, does accumulate a whole bunch of toxins and waste within the cells, and that they raise their body temperature for a short period of time to allow for a natural kind of detox, cleansing, um, and um, basically uh, increasing immune function uh, to then be able to uh, to go back into hibernation. So it's kind of a neat little story about how that and works. And it's not because as they sleep underground under their nice quilts that their <laughs> partner steals the quilts and then they have to get their temperature uh -huh. up until they get that quilt uh -huh. back. What are you trying to say? Not a thing. <laughs> but we should wrap up. We should wrap up. Okay. So we're done for today. Um, and uh, we'll go and do this again in a few more minutes for the second section. Thank you so much for joining us. Yep. And uh, we will hopefully have an even smoother section uh, the next time around. So take a look for the updates as the university starts to buy different software for yeah. us. We'll see where we'll, we are uh, next week. Yeah, we'll keep you posted. Um, email us with questions. Uh, tell us how you're doing and what we can do for you. Okay. Bye. Ta. Oh. We're not out? Nope. Red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> now we are. Leather, yellow leather. Let me just go confirm that.